Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Welcome to yet another episode of the Black Knight Podcast, presented by me, Michaeli Naden, CEO and founder of Black Knight, and Jonathan, my able-bodied American sidekick. Hello, great to be here. So, Jonathan, what are we going to talk about today, eh? Well, we've got a few exciting things to talk about. The big one that we just announced today is our new influencer sponsorship that we're doing. We're on the cutting edge here at Black Knight. We have decided to sponsor Irish YouTuber, Wild Camping Man. His name is Mark Harris. He runs the Wild Camping Ireland YouTube channel, which has been gaining followers in the last year. And we have decided to sponsor his channel. Very good. The sponsorship started this week, or last week actually, and he's running a giveaway. He's giving away a Build My Website package, which is where Black Knight will build your business or thing a simple website and host it for one year. And so if you, uh, in the show notes, I'll put a link to the blog post we put out today, which has the link to the video, and you just have to leave a comment on the video, and you can enter to win that contest. Now, Mark, his sort of USP is that he travels around Ireland and wild camps and he shows you how to do it legally, shows you how to do it safely. He gives you tips on how to camp, how to do a campsite, how to, you know, build fires and and how to make the most of your of your camping in the beautiful wild Irish landscape. And we're really excited to be sponsoring him. In addition to So the would you giveaway, would you go off so would you go off on one of these wild camping weekend type things with him? Well, I'm not much of a camper. I'm a Why not? I'm just not. I mean, I was a Boy Scout when I was a kid. I, I could camp if I had to, so I, it could be fun. Yeah, as long as it's the weather is all right. We're also giving him a new gimbal for his camera and uh, some new sound recording equipment so he can upgrade his videos. So over the next few weeks, you'll be seeing that. And yeah, it's exciting. So we're, we're working with him for the next year, and we'll see how it goes. Very good, very good. I'm looking at his website now. He's... He's got a load of different bits and pieces on there, and he seems to be running tours as well, where he can take yeah, you just, and a bunch of people he, with you with him off yeah, he, doing this he wild just, stuff. He, he just launched the tours, and he built his website with our site builder tool. So that's okay. how he found us. Very good, very good. Which brings us to another story, which I think is really, really interesting, which involves Revolut. So, Jonathan, have you got has Revolut entered the U.S. market yet? I believe they have. Right. So, Revolut. If you've been living under a rock, then you don't know what Revolut is. But if you haven't been living under a rock, you know that Revolut is what we call a challenger bank. So it's all mobile first. It's, it's app based. It's very funky, and they they were off. They were working as a kind of. Um, what would you call it? They had all sorts of, this is kind of a special name for it, but I mean, basically, it's like you're, it's technology and banking coming together. So it's uh, that fintech space. And it was kind of interesting and fun to play around with it. But they, after Brexit, things got a little bit more complicated. So they ended up moving their, their licenses around to other parts of the EU. Long story short, in the last couple of weeks, they've got full bank licensing. So they've now actually launched in Ireland as a full on bank. Which means that if you deposit money with them, you get all of the protections that you'd get with a, with a normal high street bank. And they're offering loans and a bunch of other things. I and mean, the reason why I'm so interested in this is because the Irish market for banking is a bit of a mess. I mean, there's only a couple of banks left in the market, and none of them are particularly innovative. So this this thing with Revolut is is kind of fascinating. Yeah, we have the opposite problem here in the U.S. We have plenty of banks, but none of them are innovative in any way. And so Revolut has started here, and they're with a bunch of other startups. They're trying to sort of disrupt the U.S. banking scene. But it's very difficult because of the the dinosaur regulations that our government has. Well, I mean, regu- regulations for around banking here are, you know, they're, they're probably, I mean, they're, they're sure, it's, it's not as simple as, as launching a, a lot of other businesses. And I'm not sure how how whether we're whether we're more comp- whether it's more complicated here than it would be in the U.S. But what's interesting, I think, from a consumer perspective, with this is that they're a viable alternative. Like we've got Revolut, we've got N26, 
You've got Curve, which is mostly just around payment cards. They're not actual actual bank bank. There's a couple of other companies around the edges of this, but you know the fact that they're offering something competitive is really interesting because what normally happens when you get a, you know a strong competitor in the market, it it forces some of the other companies to you know up their game a bit. So I think as a yeah, consumer, that's, that's probably welcome. Yeah, that's a good thing. It creates competition that gets them off their laurels. Yeah, yeah. Banks, uh, banks over here are not particularly great, unfortunately. Now, why, why, why is that? Is it because the market is smaller than than say other European countries? I'm not sure. I mean, it's one of those things. Like we're pay, we pay quite a bit more for banking in this country compared to a lot of others. And I think our our mortgage rates are higher. The pe- the amount we pay for um, for money in general seems to be seems to be higher and while i would have thought that we would have more competition in financial services now that we're you know that we remember the eu and all that it just hasn't really happened i mean it's the same with insurance it's the same with with a lot of these other financial products where you know essentially the irish companies are the only ones really operating in the space it's just it's just been not great, I suppose, is the best way of putting it. I could think of stronger, more <laughs> not so kind of family friendly ways of describing it. But it's if if I think with all the Irish banks now, you're paying five or six euro a month for well, just for having a bank account essentially, and then they charge you transaction fees on top of that, and you know the entire thing just as a private individual is quite expensive. And then if you're a business. You're getting hit with with tons of other fees. Uh, the one I think that hurts me the most is around foreign exchange. Like when I want to, if I buy anything in U.S. dollars, or I spend paying American money. contractors, <laughs> for example. I mean, all of those things. I mean, for us as a registrar, this is kind of important because we pay a lot of the domain name registries. We're paying them in U.S. dollars or sterling or. I'm not sure actually what other currencies we're paying them, but mainly the US dollars and sterling. It's just, you know, they, this kind of thing where it's like, oh yeah, you know, you're going to have to pay minimum of, a minimum fee of, you know, an extra 20 or 30 euro because it's going outside the eurozone, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, look, it's, I say competition is good. Be interesting to see how this pans out over the next few months, but I'm happy to see some competition there. Yeah, and I should have, do you also, do, Aren't apps like Revolut very handy when you travel internationally? And now that you're going to be traveling internationally again, it should help help smooth things around. Definitely. I mean, one of the things that I was doing with Revolut previously, back in the in as we call it the before times, when I was traveling, was like you could move money around between different currencies quite easily. I think, generally speaking, the fees you pay for foreign transactions are lower with these other with these other providers. And like ultimately, for me as a punter, you know, you go to a restaurant, you have a meal, you want to pay for the meal. Do I care which credit card I'm using to pay for it? No. What I do care about though is when I get that bill, that credit card bill at the end of the month and it's like, oh yeah, because you paid for whatever in country X, here's an extra, you know, an extra ten percent on your bill because of the foreign exchange charges or something crazy like that 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 kind of thing is just painful yeah i know as as a business owner myself when i would travel to abroad my bank is terrible for international transactions they would charge an international transaction fee they charge a percentage on the exchange rate to the point where now i use the service wise.com which i think is also in the irish market where you can keep a balance in various foreign currencies yeah. Yeah. and they, you can get a debit card that you can use anywhere and it, it's made travel so much easier especially even when i come to ireland for black night it's made it makes it a lot easier to just i just pay euros everywhere it's great yeah i mean it shouldn't it shouldn't be you know this, it shouldn't be that complicated these days i mean a lot of this stuff should be you know quite simple i mean there's there's other more complicated things that you know are, are complicated are still complicated for for you know, probably reasonably good reasons, but the, you know, being able to pay people and pay for products and services shouldn't be this painful. It should be, exact. It should be simpler and smoother. Exactly. And I know traditionally 
if you were a high net worth individual, you could easily have uh, bank accounts and multiple currencies and the accompanying debit and credit cards. But now with Revolut and Wise and, and what is it in 26, the regular people can have these things too. And, and, and it's nice. Yeah, and I mean it's 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 one of those things. Like, I mean, I've I've had I've had credit cards in multi, in other currencies other than euro for several years, just basically to facilitate payments and everything when I'm in in the US. But even just to make to pay the balance with those, if I was to do that through through one of the main street banks, was going to cost was going to cost me an extra twenty or thirty euro per transaction every single time, no matter whether I was paying them fifty euro or five thousand, it was still going to cost me a load. So. Being able to use these other companies for handling some of these payments it just makes my life so much simpler and cheaper. Anyway, moving on, moving on, moving on. What else is going on out there? I see you've got an, you're interested in what's going on in the UK because, of course, you are fascinated by all things UK. <laughs> it, is a, it is a weakness, I admit. We're hoping to fix it. <laughs> I do like Ireland quite a bit. I will admit that now. So the UK online safety bill is seeking to remake the internet. And it, as an American, I'm kind of horrified to read the details of it that, you know, it's, you know, we have a very different conception of freedom of speech in the U S than our European counterparts. And so you say, are you saying the UK is part of Europe? Well, geographically they are, but you know, culturally they are not anymore. Well, I think there's two. I think there's two things there. Let's unpack that a little. So, first off, there is definitely a distinct difference philosophically and legally between how speech is approached in the U.S. versus, I would say, the rest of the world. I mean, it's not just a, a European thing. I think it's a it's a global thing. I mean, you you have very strong and at times i would say ridiculous protections for speech in the us and i would uh, actually agree with you but i'm unusual for an american there for so many reasons but we won't go into that now on this podcast because we don't want to traumatize our poor listeners so the so the thing is i mean that's that's a that's a philosophical kind of cultural thing like in the this i see things that US television hosts or personalities are able to say that would probably land them in hot water over here for a multitude of reasons. I mean, there's, we have things like, you know, newspapers and other media are held to a particular standard. They can't just, you can't just call, say, I don't know, you can't just call a public figure a pedophile and get away with it. Whereas in, in the US, that seems to be almost excess, acceptable, from what I can understand. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of, there's a, there's a very, there's some very kind of extreme interpretations of, of of freedom of speech in the US, which I think is not particularly helpful. Now, let's that's that's one thing. The UK's approach is a whole other thing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I mean. How do I put this? I would, as a European, I would see a lot of what the UK is trying to push into this UK, into this online safety bill, as being ridiculous. And it's not just online. I mean, there's some of the other things that they've been trying to do offline that are just, well, I mean, I'm trying to think of a polite way to describe them and having difficulty. I mean, they, they're, they're insane. I mean, they're absolutely crazy. Makes you grateful for the independence, right? Oh God, yes. Um, <laughs> but the, the the thing though is that what you know tends to happen is that you know one government sees what another government is doing, and that can embolden them to it. In the case of the UK online safety bill, I mean, I'm, there's various bits of it that have been pushed around for the last. What I think. How long has it been going on? It's been going on for months, if not years. I mean, there's the, 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 I think the, the thing is, it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's an inter internet regulation gone crazy, I suppose is the simplest way of describing it. Sorry, go on. Do you foresee a lot of internet companies just saying, screw the UK market, we're not going to comply with this? Or do you think they'll, they'll comply? So, 
I think that it depends on what actually gets passed into law. In the, I mean, as far as I know, at the moment, it's still, it still hasn't been passed into law. It's still being, what you call it, it's still being debated and discussed. Yeah, they just publish what they want to do, their wish list, and now it gets to be whittled down by the parliamentary process. Yeah. I'm, but but means, I mean, they have a majority, so that they will probably get mostly what they want. Well, you see, this is the thing, though. That depends a lot on whether or not everybody within the Tory party is 100% behind it. I mean, this see, it's one of these things, you know, the it might be that... You, if somebody's to ask you, do you favor murder? Well, the answer to that is no. <laughs> okay, so I mean, that's you know, it's an extreme question. It's a very kind of binary question. You know, the answer's going to have to be no. So therefore, you know, the, the, is is the best way to stop people from murdering each other to do? And then you know, you put forward some crazy suggestion that's you know not going to be acceptable. So do, would you be okay? You know, the government putting surveillance cameras in everybody's homes. And the answer to that is probably no, because that's a terrible thing. It's a terrible idea. You don't want that. And then you know, the you know the, the reductionist type thing that you'll find on the internet is somebody's going to say, well, well, obviously that means you're obviously in favour of murder because I've just given you a perfectly good way of reducing murder. You're rejecting it, <laughs> and and that's I think is part of the the problem with some of this. It's not as simple as saying, you know, here is. Here is a solution to a problem. It's like here is, you know, that it, it might be a solution, but it might not be the solution. And maybe you need to push back on certain aspects of it and get it back to a point where it is more workable. I mean, one of the issues with, with regulation is that it can also hinder competition. Right. And, and consumer right. choice. Unintended I mean, consequences. You look at, you know, they, you know, you look at some of the big big tech companies like, you know, Facebook or Google or Amazon or any of these ones, or even like say GoDaddy, you know, they, the, these are companies that have turnovers in the, the billions or possibly more in the billions of dollars per year, have thousands of staff. They, there's a whole load of different things that they can, that they can do. Now, obviously they don't want to do it. That's another conversation, but you know, to say to Facebook, oh, you need to pay, let's say, one euro a year for every UK-based member of, of your platform. I mean, they probably wouldn't be very happy about doing that, but could they afford to do it? Yes. Could Redis afford to do that? Possibly, probably not. Right. I mean, I mean, Redis may be a very big, and maybe very big in terms of, of, of you know, mark traffic and all that, but in terms of the economics, it's a... It's a teeny little operation by comparison. Not right. denigrating, not denigrating Reddit, but let's just call a spade a spade. Like, you know, you take say here in Ireland, like the one of the most popular websites in Ireland for many years was Boards.ie. It had hundreds of thousands of, of members at, at its peak. I'm not sure how many it has these days, but just because it had a huge number of members didn't mean, doesn't mean that it had a lot, lot of money. I wasn't exactly rolling in it. Or you look at, you know, Dundee or Daft or any of these, you know, very popular websites. They're not necessarily super rich websites. I think one of the things that, you know, this online safety thing, one of the areas where some people would welcome long proposals, it's, you know, it's things like around child protection, which, you know, it's hard to argue against. But is the cure worse than the disease? Right. And that's a good segue into talking about encryption because that's a target of the bill and a target of, in the EU as well. Yeah, I mean, look, we're we're based in the EU. I mean, what they what the UK do is obviously something we're, we obviously keep an eye on. It has it can have an impact, but what hap- what the EU does is something that you know it, it involves us directly. And encryp- encryption is it's a topic. It's been a topic for a long time. It's not going to be. It's not going to go. So I assume you're talking about the was it the digital media. Oh God, what is it? Digital media. Oh, I've lost track now. So many. There's been so many of them. Digital. What's it called? It's, it's DMA. I don't know. I don't know what the acronyms actually stand for. Oh, okay. E U D M A. What the hell is that? Digital Markets Act. There you go. Ah, there you go. 
Okay, so in the, the EU has the Digital Markets Act, which I think, okay, in the, it's one of these problems where in theory, it's not a bad idea, in theory. So like looking at the Wikipedia article, the Digital Markets Act, DMA, is an EU regulation proposal, proposal under consideration by the European Commission. The DMA intends to ensure a high degree of competition in the European digital markets. Now, that's laudable by preventing large companies from abusing their market power and by allowing new players to enter the market, which is completely normal and very much part of the kind of activity you would expect the European Commission to be doing. I mean, that's very normal. I mean, this this, this is one of these things where, you know, it's it, EU competition, like, you know, it's, the, it's how we are able to operate as an ISP because the the, incum- the the formerly former incumbent had to play nice with the other children. It had to unbundle a local loop. And this is what the EU has been very good at doing for a long time. The problem is this idea, I think, of what they're calling inter- interoperability, which I think is the one which we've been looking at because we're involved with the with some of the debates around encryption. So this is, can you try to summarize what the problem is? Well, the problem is that governments hate end-to-end encryption because they can't spy on it on end users. And they also think that it's a way for people to trade child porn and do things that are not good because it's encrypted. And the governments, including the U.S. included, we would like a backdoor to encryption where they can say that in certain circumstances we will have the keys that will allow us to read all these encrypted messages but once you give once there's a key to somebody's house the house is by nature insecure okay so interoperability is the key issue with the dma which has got nothing to do with backdoors right it does involve backdoors but that's not actually what the ask is so the uh, the ask the ask yeah so the, the look the the okay there's two different things here okay so governments yes governments are always looking for backdoors into encryption fine that's not that's not new the what the dma is talking about is the idea of creating a level playing field for operators which would increase competition and all that which you know is laudable the problem is that specifically around end-to-end encryption they're pushing for what they, what they call interoperability so the idea is well there's two things interoperability and portability and this could be both of those are a bit of a problem so portability is the idea that you can take your data and move it to another provider essentially right which, you know, fine. I mean, if you're looking at messaging, you know, download an archive of your content kind of concept. I mean, okay, fine, grant, whatever. You know, can be a bit of a pain, but not the end not the end of days. The interoperability bit though is the one that I think is gonna be is the one that I think we're all a bit more concerned about because it's not exactly clear what the hell that means in real terms. And depending on how that is defined you could end up where it's weak the way to make in order for for the various messaging platforms to work together which is like this concept of interoperability kind of means then you'd have you'd have to weaken encryption to the lowest common denominator right and and that's what's the spirit of the interoperability like that things like whatsapp and imessage and facebook messenger would all have to work together in some way well, this is a bit that's not one hundred percent clear because I think the way the language has been presented, there isn't a huge amount of like this is what 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 we're doing, this is what we're driving for. Here's here's how we've here's our draft language for how we get there. I mean, based on what I'm seeing in some of the discussions that you and I are seeing, I mean that that, that mailing list is hurting my head. The sheer volume of email is just oh, I know. I've given up. I, I I've given up. I can't. I just can't. It's just too much. A lot of it is people. They're really, it's kind of got it's kind of got into this entire kind of splitting splitting the atom on on kind of ridi- on these absolutely ridiculous things. Anywho, I think it's going to be, what's going to be what I think the message need to to legislators needs to be: please don't break encryption. Like Sorry. don't 
don't let a laudable goal end up breaking something out something which is also important. I mean the 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 European the European Court of Justice handed down a decision very early this morning which is which the Irish media are having a feeding frenzy about today and it's gonna have repercussions for weeks if not so it's gonna have repercussions across all of Europe which is to do with you know to do with data retention and respect to privacy. And this it ties back into you know security as well. I mean you can you know the two go hand in hand. And you know anything that weakens encryption I would see as being unwelcome. I mean it's not and it's, it's this is the stupid thing because the, the thing with, the, with this this particular bit of legislation is aimed around fostering competition. So you want there to be the ability for other companies to enter into the space. You don't want a situation where nobody else can play because it's you know it's a, the barrier to entry is so high. Right. But you create, you create uh, so many Byzantine regulations that it's impossible for a startup to disrupt anything because they can't make heads or tails of it. Well, yeah, but here's the here's the problem. The you have to be you have to be careful because. It's very easy to take that kind of American view. Oh, these regulations, it makes it hard to innovate or compete. You follow that through to the logical, logical kind of nasty end. Is that's how you end up with IoT devices being put on the internet that are completely insecure because there's no standards. That's how you end up with people getting food poisoning. That's how you end up with people lose, literally losing their limbs because there's no standards around for safety for certain things. Like you know, the you need to you need to have some, you, know, you need to have a balance. You can't like you need to be able to allow businesses to compete and all that. I mean, obviously, I'm in favour of that. But at the same time, I'm also in favour of not killing people. I think that's you know fundamental <laughs> concept. You know, that, and I'm also, well, I'm, glad I'm, we, also I'm glad we straightened that out. <laughs> well, hey, it's come up a couple of times in this call, so why not? Like, you know, but if you look at it in terms, like, say, for example, looking at, let's say, IoT devices, like, there should be minimum standards of, you know, things like the usernames and passwords that those things ship with. You know, that's, that is not onerous. That's not an onerous requirement that, you know, that you're not allowed to ship out a device with a password or a password, for example. Or, or is that too far for your poor little American brain? No, it makes complete sense. No, and, and, that, and, that's, and that's, that's the kind of regulation that we should have. Now, should you have regulations that tell you that are, 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 so, are really very hev- are heavily prescriptive, prescriptive and tell you, you know, something like how, exactly how to do every single thing? Well, no, I don't think that's, that, that's not what anybody's saying. That's not something that I would be supportive of. But I think, you know, you can have regulations that work that also protect the consumer i mean like look at look at what's been happening over the last couple of weeks in the but in the us and in europe we've had um, loads of flight delays and cancellations here in europe i have rights my flight gets cancelled they have to rebook me they have to do something they can't leave me sitting in an airport do you have rights as a traveler in the us not really no no so which which would you prefer? You have a, a right to shout on social media until they're guilted into giving you good service. You know, but that, but this is the problem. I mean, you know, I, I'm not saying that everything that the U.S. does is wrong or that everything the EU does is right. But you know, it's very easy to take a kind of an extreme view and say, oh, you know, Europeans overregulate. I mean, the counter to that is that Americans don't regulate enough. Yeah, and then our right wing argues that there are too many regulations. <laughs> Your right wing is also trying to ban books. To organize book burnings. They haven't organized book, book burnings yet. Well, I mean, it depends on how deep you want to go into certain places in this country. I mean, I'm sure you could find somebody willing to burn some books. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the thing is, is that, I mean, I never... I would never view book burning as being as being welcome. 
Speaking of book burning, do you want to talk about our exciting trip to Austin coming up? Okay, we could, we could, we might as well mention that as we're here. So I booked flights. I actually haven't booked flights. I haven't booked flights here. I'm being bad. You booked flights. I haven't. Yes. I have a flight and we have hotels and we have tickets to NamesCon. Yes. So Austin, Texas, at the end of August through to first couple of days of September, we are meant to be attending NamesCon Global. Oh, yeah. So NamesCon used to be, well, the first few years it was held in Las Vegas. And then it moved to Austin, Texas back in, God, when was that? 2020 or 2019? I'm so confused about time. I have lost all concept of time over the last couple of years. You're not the only one. I think it was. I think it might have been 2020 that they they actually had a names con in Austin. I'm not. I must yeah. check that. I think you I went. Think I I didn't go, but you did. Yeah. So I mean, name, names con. I suppose that I'll be, let's. I'll call a spade a spade. I'll be brutally honest about it. I don't go. I wouldn't go to names con for the content. I go would go to NamesCon for the networking. Yeah, yeah I did. I'm looking... NamesCon, I went back in February of 2020. Yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting all the people that I've been talking to who live on my computer, meeting them in person. <laughs> well, if, if we let you talk to people, that is. We might, we might sequester you in your hotel room and just force you to do things. Yeah, so I, yeah, that was end of January 2020. I found all the details here. Yeah, you were it in the was, US for like um, a month. I was over for I was over for quite a lot of early 2020. Yeah, much, much to my amusement. Uh, and there was some great there's some great places to eat out in Austin. I'm really looking forward to going back there to eat out again because the the restaurants in Austin are great. They're absolutely yeah, that, fantastic. I'm looking forward to being there with you because I know I'm going to eat very well. Probably, probably. Because there is, there is a risk that you might end up eating well if you hang out with me because I do like I do like my my decent food. Ooh, the place I went to one of the last nights I was there is still open. Yeah, so that so I think you know the going to, going to Austin for names car. I think that's going to be interesting. It's probably the largest kind of commercially focused event that I'll be attending in two years. A lot of people will probably be attending the ICAM meeting in The Hague in June, but I'm not sure whether I'll be attending that at this stage uh, or not. That's, it's, it's unknown. Do you want to talk about the reason why, or do you want to keep that off the podcast? Well, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> you might get the resolution you want if you're, if you're very public about it. This is also very true. So at the moment, I cannot register to attend the ICANN meeting in The Hague. Why is that, Michaeli? Because ICANN has, is forcing everybody to agree to this, to this waiver, which I'm trying to find a polite way of describing. I suppose if I was to, a, a polite way might be to say it is a little extreme or just plain crazy. It's far too much. It's it's far too far reaching. It's asking it's asking you to sign away rights that you shouldn't sign away. Right. I mean just it just it like I would have had to, I, okay, attending an attending an event in person these days, you would it would be surprising if somebody didn't say something about COVID. Fine. And, you know, the kind of basic kind of, look, COVID's out there. Don't be a dick. Please don't sue us. You know, I don't know. I mean, I'm, that's obviously not going to be a legal document. But, you know, something, you know, except the fact that, you know, there is a risk of COVID. Take necessary precautions. You know, comply with whatever health regulations there are, et cetera, et cetera. Fine. What ICANN has done is they've gone off and they've taken that and they've taken it to a dark place. They've come up with a whole bunch of other things. Like, basically... If, um, if I could be, you know, a, mem a, a member of ICANN, in order for me to be able to sue ICANN for anything, 
I would need to probably have multiple witnesses showing that an ICANN employee was beating me up or something like that. Because even if ICANN was to actually inject me directly with COVID, they want to be to have no liability, which is a little bit more than a little insane. There's no way I can agree to that. I mean, the terms are, are crazy. By the time this podcast comes out, I might have written a blog post about that. Who knows? I've already written a blog post about the waiver over on internetnews.net because, you know, for, for me, I, I have no problem with reasonable, a reasonable waiver. It makes perfect sense to me. Like, I run a business. I get that. I, you know, you have to protect yourself from, from frivolous lawsuits. You have to protect yourself from stupid uh, legal threats. That's perfectly normal. That's perfectly acceptable. Everybody wants to do that. But there's a massive difference between protecting yourself from a, fri- from a frivolous suit and what I would consider to be basically bully boy tactics, which is you're forcing people to agree to something because you know that a lot of people want to attend a, an in-person event because they haven't been able to for the last couple of years. You know, that, that I think is, is just, it's just unreasonable. I don't think it's fair. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not how how one plays the game. But anyway, it's it's you know I just I, I just have huge issues with it, and there's no way that I'm going to agree to that. So if that means that I don't attend an ICAM meeting in person, so be it. That's the price I'll pay. Well, we will find out what happens. Yes, yes, indeed we will. Because as you know, I am very very shy about sharing my opinion. <laughs> Check out McKaylee's Twitter feed for the next seven days, and you'll find out what happens. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> yeah. And, and oh, you know, there's other things going on that I think are you know more interesting and important. I mean, the, the my my frustration at the moment is that you know there's there's it's the perfect storm of ridiculous rubbish kind of coming at me between that and that. Or we won't mention the name of the company, but this we. we You've, I sat, you've seen, we get frivolous, we get frivolous threats from um, companies all the time. It's just, it just annoys me because it's, it's the kind of thing that I know that certain people would take that threat, take some of these threats in good faith <clears throat> and wouldn't question them. So I, you know, I, I'm, yeah, I tend to, to kind of get pushed to push back on all of these things and, you know, ask them, right. You're saying that we're infringing X, Y, and Z. Well, okay, show us the proof. Tell right. us how. And there's, and there's always this assumption that you know you guys have to care about U.S. laws and regulations and cease and desist orders when they don't <sighs> apply. <You know? laughs> well, it's like, I mean, it's this kind of thing. It's like saying, well, okay, so a law exists, and I expect you now to enforce that law for us. I think, well, I'm sorry, that's not how the world works. You know, but in, you know, you, if you want to, in, if, you, if one of our clients does something bad, and I use the term bad intentionally because it's nice and vague, fine, they've done something bad. It's not our responsibility to fix every bad thing that one of our clients might have done. Now, that doesn't mean that we are not going to be responsible or not going to take some modicum of responsibility for certain types of, of activity, that's not what I'm saying. But we're not. But if one of our clients doesn't deli- doesn't deliver the product that you ordered from them, that's a customer service issue. If you don't like the color of their website, that's a subjective taste issue. If you don't like the font they're using on their website, again, that's a subjective taste issue. And by the way, these are examples of real complaints that we received. You know, we get these kind of complaints all the time, or we get complaints which involve things like, you know, husband and wife having a dispute. What's that got to do with us? Anyway, a rant over. And I think that's a good place to wrap this podcast up. Well, okay, so on our next on our next episode, um, I will try desperately not to wind Jonathan up. I will fail miserably, but you'll all find it highly entertaining or not <laughs> anyway no i'm joking yeah so no i think look you know there's there's always interesting things going on in the wonderful world of technology 
we're going to try and cover some of them here in our little conversations. If there's something you'd like us to talk about or not talk about, uh, let us know via the comments. Thank you. Thank you.